This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Hands on History with Heather. Hello, this is Heather Darcy with Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. I normally host the Hands on History segment, but I am very excited to be joined by Dennis McCarthy today, who wrote a exceptionally interesting book about Thomas North, and I can't wait to talk to him about it. Dennis, welcome, and thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much for having me. So I see you've done a lot of interesting things. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background and what drew you to Thomas North? Yeah, I'm an independent researcher. I used to write about a subject called biogeography, which is the intersection of geography and evolution. Uh, and I wrote a book on it called Here Be Dragons, How the Study of Animal and Plant Distributions Revolutionized Our Views of Life and Earth. And um that's what I was mostly doing, just writing articles, uh, scientific articles or, or that book on the subject. And that actually is what led me into Shakespeare. I have a familiarity with Shakespeare. I've read some of his plays. I've had the pleasure of visiting the Globe. I, I've seen some of the movie adaptations. What drew you to Shakespeare? So it was indeed the subject of biogeography. So as it's biogeography, the, su- the study of plant and animal distributions, I wanted to show that also ideas and memes evolve and travel around the earth just the way in the same way that plants and animals do. Religions, technologies, uh, everything, culture uh, spreads and evolves. And I want to do that with one of the most celebrated works of art in Western literature, and that is Hamlet. So I wanted to show exactly how it ended up from a Danish legend and ended up into uh, in in England and how it evolved along the way. It traveled from France and down into London. There's all sorts of ideas in Hamlet, which also made their way across the uh, across Europe into London, how they all ended up in the same brain. But when I started studying Hamlet and the sources of Hamlet, almost all editions and editors note that there was an early version of the play. Shakespeare adapted an old Hamlet. So it was, it was this original author I was kind of looking for. And there was a famous satirical comment about this old play of Hamlet written by an English Seneca. And I, that's how I started studying this. I started looking for that old author. So when we're talking about it, about Hamlet going from being a Danish legend to an English play, how far back in time were you researching? Well, this, the Danish legend, I, Saxo Grammaticus uh, actually put it into Latin in 1200, uh, around 1200 AD. And, there were, and uh, before that, it would have been a legend probably for centuries. And uh, then it was, uh, then it went to uh, France, it was translated uh by uh, uh, Francois de Belleforêt, and he uh, he put in the French in fifteen seventies, and that's and that's was then translated into the old play of Hamlet, and Shakespeare adapted it from there, the old English play of Hamlet, and that was written by the English Seneca, you said. So there was a famous satirical comment, a satire, written by Thomas Nash in fifteen eighty nine, in which he refers to this this old Hamlet written by the singer Seneca, which yields many good sentences. And, um, and Scott, it's one of the more famous comments related to Shakespeare, certainly one of the most famous. Uh, it's the first one related to Hamlet. And scholars know that it was too early for Shakespeare to have written his masterpiece. The conventional date of Hamlet, Shakespeare's authorship is 1600, about 12 years later. So why would that, I'm going to interrupt for just a second, I'm sorry, but why would that have been difficult for Shakespeare to have written Hamlet when he did? So Shakespeare, Hamlet is considered his masterpiece, and they have a progression of the canon, which kind of grows in maturity. And uh, he may not have even been in London yet. He's 25 years old in 1589. And he certainly wouldn't have been called in the Seneca, someone who had written a lot of Seneca tragedies at that point. And uh, there's all sorts of reasons. And this is conventional. This isn't me saying the scholars have accept that there's an old uh, uh, there had to be an old version of it. So he was just even starting on the early Italian uh, comedies like Taming of the Shrew. And that's when he started in 1580s and 90s and didn't get into tragedies till 1599 or 1600. So what I'm hearing you say then is so when Hamlet was produced by Shakespeare, or excuse me, when Thomas Nash wrote 
his adaptation of Hamlet. He's referring to this. I'm sorry. So Thomas Nash is a satirist. He refers to this English Seneca who wrote this. And then I determined English Seneca is Thomas North. Because so. it couldn't be Shakespeare because Shakespeare was too young. Shakespeare's too young. Yeah. Okay. There's a reference to an early Romeo and Juliet two years before Shakespeare was born. The, eventually, what I started to discover, scholars accept that Shakespeare frequently adapted old plays. So who is Thomas North? So Thomas North, uh, when I started searching for this English Seneca and references throughout Nash's satire, you, I kept coming across this author, this translator of... Uh, most famously known as a translator of Plutarch's Lives, uh, which Shakespeare famously used for the Roman plays, uh, Julius Caesar, Antony and Cleopatra, and Coriolanus. And he was a very interesting figure, a well-traveled diplomat. He uh, traveled throughout all of Italy and stayed at all the palaces on different embassies. He was on an embassy to Rome as a young man, um, and then again on an embassy to France. Uh, in the 1570s, he worked, uh, he wrote for the Earl of Leicester, his patron, along with uh, other writers of the era, Philip Sidney and uh, Edmund Spencer. And uh, he, the last 20 years of his life, 1580 into, into 1580s into the 1600s, he was impoverished. Uh, his brother stopped supporting him and he was often at war abroad in Ireland and um, uh, the Low Countries. and. Uh, even at the siege of Rouen. Do we know around when he was born? 1535. So he's almost exactly Elizabethan in that uh, he was born a couple of years after uh, Queen Elizabeth and uh, and died probably not long after she died. So you mentioned his translation of Plutarch's Lives. Was right. that his first major publication? No, that was his third. He started in 1557, a very young, 22, a massive uh, translation called The Dial of Princes, which turns out to have also been a major source for uh, Shakespeare plays. All sorts of passages are taken from it. And then The Moral Philosophy of Donny, which is about Italian beast fables. Then it was Plutarch's Lives. And did he begin writing plays at around this same time? Yeah, he started quite early. So he started writing plays uh for lincoln's inn and he was master of revels there and so lincoln's inn is a law school it's one of the inns of court at the time and he was there from 1556 uh into the 1560s and uh he then started writing plays for lester's men that was his primary uh, what he spent most of his life doing until Lester died in 1588. And Lester's Men is the theater company of the Earl of Lester. Were you able to draw any parallels between Thomas North's early plays and some of Shakespeare's works? Yeah. So, uh, so all of the all of the plays he was writing are early versions of Shakespeare plays. So, one of the one of the great finds uh, we have, and June Schluter, the person I've uh, worked with, she's Professor Emerita at Lafayette College, and we co-authored a book on Thomas North's journal. She uh, It was her husband, Paul Schluter, who found notice of this journal. We didn't even know this is long after we had known that Thomas North had written a lot of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, but he kept a journal as he went to Italy, and it was used for Winter's Tale and Henry VIII. The entries he used them and the experience he used for both those plays, which um, which he wrote in the 1550s. Does the information in his private journal, does that, do those experiences appear to be source material for these early plays? Yes. Yes. So there, so the stories, the images, the facts uh, that he, he encountered there, for example, there's, uh, he describes a cardinal parade that he sees in Rome and describes him row by row, the marchers, and uh, he puts a cardinal parade in Henry VIII. And you see that it's the exact same thing, and it's row by row, the marchers. And then he describes a consistory right after that, and there's a consistory in, in his journal. And then the, the courtroom of Catherine's trial in Henry VIII is described like a consistory. And so both descriptions from Norse journal are then used in Henry VIII. That's one of the ways he uses his experiences. It's the same thing with uh, the Winter's Tale, in which he was at a 
went to a very famous church, a lot of editions, some editions of Winter's Tale or analysis of Winter's Tale will mention this ter- church outside of Mantua, which was decorated by uh, Giulio Romano, who is the artist mentioned in Winter's Tale. And it has extraordinary theatrical lifelike statues. And that was that's the main scene in the Winter's Tale at the end. The climax is the lifelike statue by Giulio Romano of uh, uh, Perdita's mother, Hermione. And we can place Thomas North in that church, and he's talking about the lifelike statues there. And there's all sorts of other scenes in the journal that um, relate to Winter's Tale, as well as Henry Day. So how were you able to put together that Thomas North's early works, his translations, his journal, and so on, that those fed into or were used as source material by Shakespeare? Well, one of the things that I used was uh, plagiarism software first when I, in order to find all the passages. So I put Thomas Norris works um, into plagiarism software along with William Shakespeare's, and then it, it just exploded. So it was passage after passage after passage. And um, and what I believe, so and what, what I think the evidence is quite clear about is that the reason that all these passages from Shakespeare's plays, from Thomas North's translations are in the plays is not that Shakespeare is plagiarizing Thomas North's translations, but that he was adapting North's plays. It was North himself who put all his, he was remembering his past writings, who would, when he would write his humanist wisdom, when he would borrow a, a passage or use it, he would use the same language and then, uh, and then it remained in the plays that Shakespeare adapted. If we can, I wanted to talk about one specific play. There's, is it Arden of Faversham? Oh, sure. Yeah. So yes. you go into great detail about that play. And I was hoping that you could tell us first about the, the Shakespeare play. So a little out of order, the Shakespeare play. And then if you could tell us about Thomas North and what he wrote, because I thought that was absolutely fascinating and that, and it does have some of the linguistic mirrors that you're discussing now, but I was hoping that we could talk about that play first with Shakespeare and then with Thomas North, because it really helps illustrate your point, I think. Yeah, sure. Scholars, um, Arden of Faversham uh, is now in the Oxford, it's a tragedy, it's a domestic tragedy. It's now in the Oxford uh, collection of plays. It w- was an anonymous play published in 1592, and scholars have noticed all the Shakespearean qualities in the play, and have now it is now they believe that Shakespeare wrote it, and it has been placed in the Shakespeare canon. Uh, but this story is about Alice Arden and her lover Mosby, who end up murdering uh, her husband Thomas Mosby. Uh, in a spectacularly gruesome fashion. It's, he clocks him, uh, Mosby does clocks him on the head with his pressing iron. He was a tailor. She, um, and she ends up stabbing him with a, uh, with a kitchen knife, a butcher knife. And uh, it turns out that Alice Arden is Thomas North's half sister. Thomas Mosby is a North family servant. And um, he knew everyone involved in the crime, but the so was it a real crime? It was a real crime, yeah. So, so that's really happened. It happened when he was a young man, and I believe that this was one of his first plays. So Thomas North's sis- half-sister did, right. in fact, murder her husband right. to be with the family servant. With the North family servant. And then that's that familiar. just so happens and to pop up in a play that written by what's now been accepted as written by Shakespeare. Right. And, did and it's Norris passages, and you and at the time. So I believe he wrote it in 1557, and uh, or around that time. This is when Thomas Norris' Dial of Princes is out, and which is his translation. You've got many passages from Dial of Princes that are also in the play. So it's not just Thomas Norris' life; it's his writings in that tragedy. And the murder was then used as the basis for the Macbeth's murder uh, later on. Uh, and he would get to that. He would revise the play in 1592. And I believe he also wrote an early version of Macbeth. How do we think that Shakespeare came across North's works? Well, Shakespeare was a very, very busy man. He uh, was uh, really the lead producer of plays for a theater company that was producing 40 plays a year. And Shakespeare would write about two plays a year. And the rest they had to get from other writers so that every 
theater company, which was really blowing up in London at the time, were just, they just needed plays and they purchased all sorts of plays um, that they could find. And they hired all sorts of playwrights that they could find. And Thomas North was in London, needed money at the time. And he had all these old plays that he had written for Lester's Men that very few people had seen. Only Lester's Men had performed them at noblemen's houses or at court before the Queen. So, and it's not just Shakespeare's company, but all companies at the time were indeed adapting old plays. They were revising old plays because they needed it for the uh, uh, to for their repertoire, which was citizens were hungry for plays they hadn't seen. So that's how Shakespeare just purchased Thomas North's plays. Is he purchased all sorts of plays and then performed them? But Shakespeare adapted North's plays, and those, and then. They would he would sell them to printers. So you've mentioned Lester's men a couple times, and I would assume that's Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, as to who yes. you're referring. Are there any particular plays of Shakespeare's which seem to draw parallels to the ones that we know were written by North during his time with Lester's men? Yeah, there's a lot. There's you know, there's um three different plays uh actually attack the suitors of Queen Elizabeth, who at the time, and it's when they were, uh, when when the play, when North was originally writing these source plays, he attacks the suitors of Queen Elizabeth that, uh, that Lester hated because he wanted to marry the queen and he didn't want anyone else to marry the queen. Uh, the most obvious one is the Duke of, uh, Duke of Anjou, Anjou, Duke of Anson. There was the big marriage question of the 1570s. And all of Lester's men were at the time writing about an earlier marriage of Henry VI, marriage of an English monarch to a French, uh, to into French nobility and how disastrous, disastrous it was. And that right, was through the Wars of the Roses. Wars of the Roses resulted when Henry VI married Margaret of Anjou. So they use that as an analogy. Queen Elizabeth, you shouldn't marry the Duke of Anjou. And that's the plays on Henry VI. And that's when Thomas North started writing those in the late 15, in the late 1570s. I wanted to ask you about A Midsummer Night's Dream. That play is fascinating and bizarre and delightful. Do we see any parallels from that to anything written by Thomas North? Yeah. So the once again, the Thomas North, you can literally say he lived the play so that you can go through his life and he actually experienced it. And that may seem fantastic because there's plays like Winter's Tale or Midsummer Night's Dream, which just seem like fairy tales and just outlandish. But he actually even lived. A Midsummer Night's Dream. It's based on the Kenilworth festivities. In which could we just one second, could we briefly talk about, could you tell us the outline of Midsummer Night's Dream just for those who might not be super familiar with it? Sure. A Midsummer Night's Dream is a very uh, kind of fantastic fairy tale type uh, type play in which uh, there's uh, fairies in the forest and there's all sorts of magical happenings. And there's juice from a plant that uh, one of the fairies pours into one of the uh, character's eyes, which makes, and the juice of the plant, plant is famous for causing that person to fall in love with the next person they see, uh, that they see. Uh, and uh, there's all sorts of romantic hijinks involved, and there's all sorts of um, uh, switches of uh, people. Uh, who formerly loved one person, then love another. But all this is taking place in this fairy-strewn forest, which is extraordinarily magical. And uh, Puck is one of the famous, uh, or Robin Goodfellow is one of the famous characters in the play. And it's it's absolutely delightful. And it's a, it's a certainly a crowd pleaser. And is there a fairy queen in it as well? Yeah, Titania is the fairy queen and Oberon is the... Uh, King of the Fairies, and um, they are the they have their own roles, and the, they're the ones that are uh, leaders of this forest. But uh, there's a remarkable descriptions in it, in which they're that are based on Lester's fairy strewn forest. He created this magical fairy strewn forest for Elizabeth in 1575 when she came to visit him, and she had all these spectacular entertainments. Famously, he even had he had this man-made lake on his property, and he had this uh, m- both a giant mermaid and a dolphin 
cr- constructed so that you could fit musicians inside them. And uh, they were playing music. The one dolphin had Arion, the mythical fig- figure of Arion, who famously uh, survived uh, a shipwreck by being brought in by a dolphin. But he sings to the queen and everything like that. And there's another one that with a, a mermaid and uh, those descriptions that of that ornamental lake is also in a Midsummer Night's Dream. And that's conventional. Scholars have, you'll see in, in most biographies of Shakespeare, they'll talk about uh, the Kenilworth pageant, which is 1575. Shakespeare's 11 at the time. There's no way he really could have gotten close or, you know, experienced these. So would um, Thomas North have been there just as a member yeah, of yeah. Tom of excuse me um Dudley's the Earl of Leicester's court? Right. Yes, he would have been there. In fact, he'd have probably been working on many of the entertainments. And how old would he have been? Well, he was almost the same age as Elizabeth, so in his 30s, right. so he was 40s. He was exactly 40. There uh exactly 40 in 1575, yes. And then did he did Thomas North write a play that was inspired by Lester's Kenilworth wooing or yes. Okay. so yes yeah. so I so then he wrote so he wrote a play as he everything uh, in his play has he based it on what he was writing uh at the time there's all sorts of passages it's from Plutarch's lives at the mm-hmm. time and there's uh uh, and base it on his life. He whatever any sort of image or any sort of scene that is absolutely spectacular in his life, Thomas North put in the plays. This is one of the most. The, these were the entertainments of the century that Lester tried because he was trying to marry Queen Elizabeth. He put on the most spectacular show he could, and they're all described in Midsummer Night's Dream. And Thomas North had a front row seat. That almost makes a Midsummer Night's Dream seem logical in a way, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, what is shocking? It's a, it, it's the same thing with Winter's Tale. They these things which seem just fantastic and uh, and just out of uh, just otherworldly suddenly gains a, a, a logical coherence once you know why they were written and when. And earlier you were saying that you used this plagiarism software to find linguistic similarities between Shakespeare's and North's writings. Did you find that with A Midsummer Night's Dream? Yeah, every play in the canon, every play in the canon. Some of those had uh, already even been noticed. In fact, um, uh, there's a yeah, there's a famous uh, uh, passage on Titania uh, about the the ravishings of Theseus, and that's straight from Notice Plutarch's lives at the time, but there's also, there's many other passages as well. The juice of the plant, the entire, uh, the entire plant, which if you rub the juice of it, which actually bleeds, it's actually blood, the, the plant, if you cut it, bleeds. If you rub the juice of it in the eyes, they fall in love with the next person they see, that's from North Style of Princes. So it's, it's his experiences and his writings, and he brings it together, and that's every play. And that's in Thomas North, by the way. Let me get a plug in for the book. Thomas North, yes, the original yes. author of the Shakespeare canon. Yes. And don't worry, we'll talk more no, about no, where to find your works and everything. <laughs> I'm just, I'm really enjoying this conversation because, again, as someone who's familiar with Shakespeare, I had no idea who Thomas North was. Right. And right. Um, I think He's not everyone, well known. No, no. Why would he be? I mean, we don't right. really, I don't even know how many of his, I, it sounds like maybe other than his translations, um, that there's not any easily accessible items of his that have been written down, recorded, and are accessible to the common person. No, no. In fact, it, only Plutarch's Lives is really that it was really accessible. When I started working, it was really just uh, in 2005. And fortunately for early English books online, I was able to access, if it weren't for that, I was able to access his other writings, like The Dial of Princess, like Moral Philosophy of Donnie, which would be very difficult to do. And then he, he has another translation, early 1600s. Um, but like, for example, Dial of Princes was probably never reproduced in its full form uh, after 1619. So unless I go to a library with an ancient book and they, I have to sit there and read it at the time, I, you know, I'd have to go to England or wherever, Harvard probably has one. And um I would. I just would have had no way of reading these books, but it's because of the internet, and I, I was able to 
find it. And then now we found his journal and we found other works as well. And early English books online, that's something you can access from a research library or I imagine have a subscription to from yeah. home. Yes. Uh, June Schluter uh, allows me, at Lafayette gives me access. Most universities have uh, have access to it, which you can do on your computer right now, which makes the computer a magical library. It really does. It does. Uh, yes. I mean, from even just to go on a brief tangent with the things that I research, it's just astounding what you can find online these days. So for anyone that's interested in writing or researching or learning about history, you can absolutely find some right. real gems online for free. Yeah. Or this very- discovery would not have been made without without things, without databases like early English books online. So at uh, what point did you decide or what caused you to decide to write this book about Thomas North? being effectively the writer of Shakespeare's plays? So, uh, well, I, when I was studying, first of all, Nash, um, Thomas Nash and his reference to uh, Thomas North as this English Seneca who wrote this original Hamlet, and you start tracing down all the writings of Nash and then other satirists of, of the era, you realize they're constantly referring to him, and it's not just Hamlet. They, they uh, attribute to him other older plays. Is it Shakespeare. just as old Seneca or are there other nicknames for him? Uh, it, he's Boreas. At one time he's called in the thing, which is in Nash's, which is uh, uh, Greek for North and the North Wind. Uh, he's called at one point. Another, and he's the first article I published was Sir John Daw as uh, Sir Thomas North, which is about a character in Ben Jonson's Epicene. But all of them are linking him to Shakespeare's plays, and they make him to be the, make him out to be this kind of older writer who believes his writings are 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 wonderful. But he was broke and impoverished, and Groats with Wit, and I believe, tells the entire story of Thomas North and why he sold plays to Shakespeare. Can you tell us a little bit more about Thomas North's life as a person and not just so that we can have a little bit more familiarity with him? Right. So after so 1550s, his sister commits the murder of the century. Uh, He goes to Rome, comes back. He's at Lincoln's Inn. He's studying, uh, supposedly studying to be a law, but he really dedicates himself to scholarship and uh, he tries to please Lester. His first plays were trying to please Queen Mary. That's they were kind of Catholic. Henry VIII was to do that. It glorifies her mother, Catherine of Aragon, and um, so does Winter's Tale is an allegory on the life of Queen Mary. And then he's now trying to please Lester, and he gets he manages to get in his good graces, and he's writing for him for literally decades. But in in between that time, he goes on different embassies. Fifteen eighty, he gets in trouble. And he's banished to Ireland. And I believe it's because of a play he wrote. I believe it's because of the everyone on Lester's side, Spencer, Sidney, who was writing against the marriage to the Duke of Anjou, end up kind of banished and in trouble. And and Thomas North ends up in Ireland uh, fighting against the uh, Des- Second Desmond Rebellion or uh, Captain McMorris Rebellion, as it's sometimes called. And then uh, he's got wars. From then on to the rest of his life, and he's in poverty. He's back in London every now and then, and uh, and uh, that's 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 about it. He's in London at the in sixteen hundred. He's at the he's at the uh, he's finally managed to get in the good graces of Queen Elizabeth because he does something to stop the Essex Rebellion. Uh, it's not clarified, but he's rewarded greatly. This is in sixteen oh one. And he's given a post um, at Postern Gate, uh, which is in London, to uh, keep watch over um, over the gate and make sure there's a watch always there at the gate entering that uh, that side of London. And I believe if you go visit the Tower of London today, it would have been on the opposite side of the yes. old moat. So you can walk in the area where that yeah. gate was. It's just not standing anymore. But there's a fabulous right. picture in your book where you can look at and see, oh, that's where the gate was. Yes. So you mentioned that he did something to stop the Essex Rebellion. That was, of course, Robert Dudley's, I believe, his stepson, the Earl of Essex, who had a bit of a saucy relationship with Queen Elizabeth, who is... Right. 
far more mature than he was. And there was a brief time where he, if I remember correctly, he was trying to actually overthrow her. Yeah. He, or, yeah. Yeah. He tries to, he starts a rebellion famously uh, in 1601, famously has people. Uh, Essex is the one who knighted North, by the way. And that was at the siege of Rouen. And but he has people use Richard II, Shakespeare's Richard II, which I believe uh, was uh, originally written by Thomas North, and to get it to stir up the uh, to stir up uh, Londoners to join him in the rebellion. And the reason is because he is the dashing Bolingbroke was written, and this is conventional. Bolingbroke was written as a kind of uh, to glorify Essex. He was is a stand-in for Essex. That's the character Bolingbroke deposes and takes over the crown of Richard II in the play. And Richard II is Queen Elizabeth. Famously, she says to an historian at the time, I am Richard II. No, you're not that. And so the trial of Essex had a lot to do with the uh, with the works on Richard II. And it was noted that Essex loved the play. And that was obvious to whoever was watching those plays at that time. It sounds it, like it really was. It, it, it was even even people would when describing Essex later they would they would quote descriptions of Bolingbroke, uh, it, which is who became Henry the Fourth. Uh, they would use descriptions of him to describe Essex, and uh, uh, and Richard the Second is famously there was a historical things placed into the play uh, in order to draw resemblances. For example, they had a they had him mismanaging a war in Ireland. Uh, at the time, there was no war in Ireland under Richard II. And that's one of the things, you know, that, that was brought out, brought out at the trial. And he was trying to use it to to kill Queen Elizabeth. But Thomas North did something to he gets a 10 pound reward more than anyone else for stopping the Essex Rebellion. And then he gets that post right afterward and he gets an annuity. He gets a. Um, Queen Elizabeth grants him 40 pounds a year uh, after that. And um, when you read, when you try to determine exactly what Thomas North did, he's not stopping the, the he's not there. He's not as a knight. He's, 60, he's late 60s at this time. But he's not there um, in any way stopping the rebellion physically. He's not uh, one of the knights that are leading people against Essex. And the only thing left is he was kind of an Essex insider is that he warned the queen about and the crown that he was about to rebel on that day. So we've talked about a lot today, and I just want to make sure that I am understanding everything that you're saying, because it's very interesting. So we have this gentleman named Thomas North. He's born in around 1535 into a noble family. And he is a bit of a scholar on this side. And he starts by translating important works such as The Dial of Princes and Plutarch's Lives. And his first works are published when he's about 19 or 20 years old. He also begins to write plays, one in particular, while well, all of them seem to be based off or greatly influenced by events in his life. But he begins writing these in the 1550s, so long before Shakespeare really had a meaningful yeah was born or even had a meaningful thought in his head and then curiously all of these themes start to show up in Shakespeare's plays because as you were saying before they were playwrights of the time were just churning out as much entertainment as they could and of course by the time that Shakespeare is really starting we have Sir Thomas North is in the employ of Robert Dudley the Earl of Leicester who is Elizabeth the first favorite and the way that you were able to concretely establish that Thomas North's plays are the sources for all of Shakespeare's plays was by using plagiarism software and finding that the use of language, because we all have an individual linguistic fingerprint effectively, the linguistic parallels between Thomas North and Shakespeare are so similar that it could not be an accident. Do I yeah, have it right? The, the, yes. The, there, you, there are thousands of unique lines, and by unique, in which 
in which originally appeared in Thomas Norris translations and then the Shakespeare plays. And by unique, I mean occur nowhere else in the history of the English language, not before or since. And anyone who does use that line, whatever it is, a word that might be to the prejudice of, or uh, whatever the line may be, is necessarily quoting uh, Thomas North or mostly Shakespeare. It was necessarily quoting Shakespeare or occasionally Thomas North. And you see this in uh, play after play and uh, line after line. And there's no one that's borrowed as much from an earlier author than Shakespeare is from North. And the question is whether Shakespeare was obsessively plagiarizing all of Thomas North's translations and borrowing certain passages uh, every time he wrote a play for decades, or more likely what was going on was that he was just adapting North's plays and it was North who was using his own language. Uh, and they aren't just lines, they're lines that occur when the borrowed uh, word strings occur, they occur in the identical context. So whether gardeners are uh, talking about comparing uh, gardens to commonwealth, for example, and then you'll find exactly that passage coming from both uh, Plutarch's Lives and Dial Princes and Put in Richard II. And it's, and it's the same thing over and over. And Thomas North's life is in the plays as well. And the satirists were identifying Thomas North as the original author. And now we also have documents, unpublished writings that we know were used for Shakespeare's writings, which kind of ends all argument. Well, and what I really like about the structure of your book is that you have these tables in your book going through the the canon of Shakespeare's plays and putting the language side by side, what we find in Thomas North's writings with what Shakespeare wrote. And I think that that makes your argument very convincing. So one thing I like about writing is particularly with history, it is very difficult to prove anything beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, it is. However, what I think historians can do is they can prove something to the extent that someone else come back at me and show me that I'm wrong. So yes. I would be very curious to see someone come back to prove that you're wrong. Yeah. So, yeah. and I think that's... <laughs> That's really the best the best level to get to. So congratulations. I mean, I'm not a Shakespeare scholar, so but for whatever it's worth, I, I think your argument's excellent and it it makes a heck of a lot of sense. And from thank you. What I but and by the way, I just want to add that no one denies that Shakespeare used old plays. They know these old plays existed. And they just had to figure out um we just had to figure out who wrote them. And that, that was the difficult thing. And when it's Thomas North's passages and his life, and we've now documented that North was a playwright for Lester's men, everything then makes sense. And it's just a very easy explanation. And there's always a question of how did Shakespeare get all of this information, like from Italy and about Giulio Romano or about uh, the, the murder of uh, the Duke of Urbino and all this Italian information in the plays, for example, all this legal information. And they were in the source plays that he used. They know he used old plays. That's where it was. And it was Thomas North who wrote them. So we talked about plays that Thomas North or works that Thomas North wrote during Mary the First reign and then during Elizabeth the First reign. And that's, of course, when we start to see Shakespeare using Thomas North's plays as source material. Was there anything produced during the time that James I and VI was on the throne that we can relate back to North? Yeah, so the, uh, the he, Thomas North just barely lived into, uh, into the reign, but he was constantly trying, Lester died in 1588, and he was trying to... Um, trying to find a new patron and trying to actually get involved and become uh, somewhat uh, important and uh, at least taken care of in the in the regime that was going to come after Elizabeth. And he's, he first attached himself to Essex, which uh, didn't work out as Essex was a little crazy and tried to rebel. And then he, he started writing things very pro-James. Um, uh, all throughout the 1590s, other people were doing this as well because they were anticipating his, uh, uh, his, he was going to become king. And the a famous example that we just found the big news of last year was that Michael Blanding, who I should have mentioned much earlier, who's written a, a book on this subject and, uh, and about uh, how I uh, came across it, uh, called In Shakespeare's Shadow, great book. And uh, he found a copy of a history book 
at Harvard Library, which is a North family. It has the North family inscription in it. And Thomas North annotated it, and it was used for Cymbeline. And all of his notes in it, Thomas North's handwriting, um, uh, essentially put an outline of the play Cymbeline, which is a pro-James work. So I want to ask two questions then. First, could you give us an outline of Cymbeline? And secondly, for those of us who aren't as familiar with terms about old books. Could you tell us what marginalia means? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, marginal notes. So he's writing in the margins. He's writing comments and notes in uh, uh, in on the side of the page. And he's writing it next to passages that scholars know were used for Cymbeline. But he'll write out sentences. For example, he writes out in one one example is Cassibilon, uh, uh, and he spells it that way with a U. Cassibilon, um, uh, it granted Rome a tribute uh, yearly uh, three thousand pounds, which is almost an identical line in in Cymbeline, and it's an important point for the play, and uh, and it's misspelled the same way in the play. And then you turn the page, and then he's writing about uh, Guiderius and Arviragus, who are two other characters, uh, two other characters in Cymbeline. I should be careful when I'm pronouncing these as I. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to other and exactly what they do in terms of the denial of tribute, uh, the invasion of uh, the invasion of Rome of England and how they do it. And there's elements that you find when you're reading Norse notes, you finally find out, oh, this is where this came from in Cymbeline that scholars didn't know before. For example, the name Caius Lucius as the general that invades invades London and Cymbeline is taken from one of the passages that North marked in which he marks uh, the names Caius and Lucius. Could you tell us the, the plot of Cymbeline and then tell us a little bit more about how, I, I think you might've already told us about how it came from Thomas North's work, but if you have other comments about it, so what is the plot of Cymbeline? So it's, the, it's meant to glorify ancient Britain and, uh, and show that a, a time when Britain did best Rome. And so it's a story about the King Cymbeline. It's mostly, it's not really a history the way Henry V or Richard II is a history where it's a straight chronology. It's a scattering of historical facts, which is one of the reasons also why you know that Thomas North had to have written this play. Um, with all of the facts are, he marks out. It's a scattering of historical facts occurring around uh, from right around the first century to the second century uh, AD. And uh, and it's about Britain refusing to play, pay Rome a tribute. Rome invades and uh, Rome wins. But particularly these two, uh, the two uh, uh, princes who are kidnapped princes in, in the play uh, and live a life of why live a life. They're wild in the mountains of uh in the mountains of Wales, and they, uh, they're they the ones, Guderius uh, and uh, Arviragus are the ones that really defeat Rome. And the whole point was that at the time, James I wanted to unite all of Britain, England, Scotland, Wales, under, under one rule, and that was his dream. But every there's all sorts of snobby English people at the time saying, no, the last time that we were one Britain was back when Rome had conquered us and we always lost to them and we were a bunch of savages and we were unlettered and stupid. And so now England is the glory of the civilization. Let's just keep it England. And so North wrote simply, and it's a, it's a pro-union play. And by the way, it's a pro-union, uh, have all, all three countries together. So is Cymbeline, is that based off one of North's plays or just based off his yeah. writings? It is. No, okay. it's based off his plays. So, so, so those notes uh, were had to have been used for a play because it, it, it's impossible to reverse engineer this, where if somehow Shakespeare got hold of the North family Fabian and saw these marginal notes and trying to construct a play out of what he wrote is just to... Um, it, it it just wouldn't it just wouldn't work. It's just it's it's too hard. It, you only understand the notes after you know Cymbeline, and it seems impossible to reconstruct. And it seems a bizarre exercise yeah, effort or exercise to do anyway. And that comes back to your point about how when he was at the at the um, inns of court and writing 
for Lester's men that a lot of his plays, either if they were written down, they weren't mass produced or. No, right. right. So, this would have been sold directly to Shakespeare. This would probably would have been never produced at all other than by Shakespeare. And he didn't do it till 1610, which which was even after when the argument over the union uh, of uh, Britain uh, was over and it was no longer a, a controversial political point because it they never did it. And James became king in 1603. Yep. Okay, so right. seven years after that. And there were other parallels to in Cymbeline that seemed to echo what was happening within the Holy Roman Empire as well, I noticed in your book. Yeah. Oh, yes. The Holy Roman Empire, uh, which I think as Voltaire said, was none of those things. No, none of them. But it was fabulous. <laughs> Um, in my humble opinion. So tell us the full title of your book. How do we get it? Okay, so it's Thomas North, the original the original author of Shakespeare's plays. And by that, I mean source plays. Again, no one denies Shakespeare used old plays. Now we know who wrote them. That's not the full subtitle, just the first. Thomas North, the original author of Shakespeare plays. It's on Kindle right now. We'll be out in paperback soon. You can get it on Amazon, uh, on on Kindle, and you can go to my website, www.sirthomasnorth.com. And how do we get a copy of the academic book that you co-authored? The, co- uh, the That will be at, that will also be on Amazon or, or the, uh, I've got a couple, Thomas North's Travel Journal, 1555 Travel Journal, which is out of uh, uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University Press. And a brief discourse of rebellions and rebels, which was uh, out of uh, Boydell and Brewer in association with the British Library. Those are very expensive books, by the way. That's one of the reasons uh, that the Thomas North, the original author of Shakespeare Plays, is $9.99. The hardcover copies of the others were both over $100. That was not my fault. That's academic books are way overpriced and universities buy them and that's it. And it's hard to make them access. So this, I'm trying to make this widely accessible to, uh, to everyone. And thank you for that. You can, you can either try to change something from the inside out or the outside in, and it seems to be easier to do it the second way. Um, with the, the rebels book, I'm sorry, what's the title? A brief discourse of rebellion of rebels, which was a manuscript by George North, which is a cousin of Thomas North. Yes. Okay. And, um, and the subtitle is a newly uncovered manuscript source for Shakespeare's plays. So that's another, it's one of the many smoking guns. We found a manuscript for, uh, uh, that, it, which writes about Thomas George does in the, uh, in the manuscript and, and Thomas used it to particularly to work on the plays on Henry the sixth and, uh, and Shakespeare adapted it. So that's why that's was how a, manuscript that was never copied and kept at the North family library could be a source for Shakespeare plays. It was because Thomas North was the conduit. So we can get copies of all of your books on Amazon. Maybe yeah. a couple of those we can, it might be better to go find them in the library. And yeah. then you have your website of sirthomasnorth.com. Is there anything else you'd like us to know about? Um, no, I think uh, maybe Time Magazine is doing an article coming out soon. We'll see. There's a lot. There's been some very nice press on it, but this was my best interview yet. It was very, very probing and uh, and uh, wonderful. And you are uh, you're you must do something. You must be questioning people for a living at some point. I do. Or... <laughs> it's like I do that all week long. Yeah, right? you must. Do. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us. Again, this is Heather Darcy. I'm normally the host of Hands on History with Tudor's Dynasty, but I was very excited to read Dennis McCarthy's book on Thomas North. And we will make sure to put a link to his, the Kindle version of his book and also to his website. So thank you so much for joining us and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Heather. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.